Thank you. So uh, we will start the, uh, the third, third session. And uh, Nancy, Nancy Duxbury, will, will begin her presentation. Um, I think it is Cultural Mapping as Cultural Inquiry is the title she's chosen for this. Uh, we're perhaps getting a little more concrete and starting the process. Um, and uh, let's see how this goes. I'm sure it'll go fine. So thank you for coming a long way, uh, Nancy. And uh, yeah. So. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Okay. Thank you. And thank you so much for involving me in this um, event. And this, the, to be part of the trilogy is quite an honor. Um, I'll, since there wasn't a quick, I'll quickly introduce myself and then hopefully not keep you from lunch. So I'm very conscious that the time is ticking. Um, so I'm a researcher at the Center for Social Studies at the University of Coimbra in Portugal and within the research group on cities, cultures, and architecture. Um, I'm Canadian originally, living in Portugal now. Um, I, I live on both coasts, so in Halifax on the East Coast, the Atlantic Coast, as well as Vancouver for 20 years on the Pacific Coast. And now I split my time between Coimbra on the mainland of Portugal, which is in between port, uh, halfway between Porto and Lisbon, and Ponta Delgada, which is on the Azores Islands in San Miguel, in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. So my, uh, but this is a very international spread um, that I'll be looking at from none, most of the examples don't come from any of those places. But I guess just as background that um, my recent experiences are more with smaller places and not huge metropolises. So. Let's see, I won't do an outline, I'll just continue. So I'll begin with just a few definitions of cultural mapping. Um, I'm a bit nervous because I know there's lots of presentations and sessions coming up all with cultural mapping, probably all with different definitions. So this is just a first introductory structure. Oh, I should also say that I'm taking sort of a kaleidoscope of, uh, approach. So there are many examples many too many to give you a good, good background about each of them, but you're free to come up and ask me about them afterward, but lots of pictures, hopefully. So the, one of the earlier definitions of cultural mapping that actually came from the cultural, uh, sorry, the yeah, cultural mapping toolkit from the Canadian um, C Creative Cities of Canada, Cre Creative City Network of Canada, um, which I think well, there's two representatives somewhere here. Um, which they find it very operational. This was a very um, accessible, practice-oriented guide to how to do cultural mapping for municipalities. And it was put online, which made it very accessible and internationally referenced since that time. And its definition of cultural mapping is very much about the process one takes, a process of collecting, recording, analyzing, and synthesizing information in order to describe the cultural resources networks, links, and patterns of usage of a given community or group. Another definition on a similar line comes from another cultural mapping toolkit, this one from Malaysia, I believe, which talks about cultural mapping providing an integrated picture of the total, of the cultural character, significance, and workings of a place with an added um, emphasis on the use of this type of information or this type of information gathering. And in this case, it was um, seen as to help communities recognize, celebrate, and support cultural diversity for economic, social, and regional development. In other countries, there are always taglines like this that um, once you map your cultural resources, you'll, they'll be visible and you'll be able to operationalize them into tourism contexts or for other um, development projects. So where the title of this presentation comes from, in 2015 I was involved in putting together an edited book on cultural mapping um, in which we defined it both as an emerging field of interdisciplinary research as well as a methodological tool in participating participatory planning and community development. In other words, a research field, but really tightly connected to practice. And as part of that, the idea that there is well, lots of theorization happening, but there is also a lot of practice happening by municipalities, by artists, 
by nonprofit groups and other collectives, and that they should mutually inform each other and not be a one-way um, path. Um, and as part of that, there was an aim to, again, make visible cultural assets of various sorts, as well as cultural mapping as a process to bring together a diverse range of stakeholders to talk about and think about the cultural dimensions and potentialities of place. And just, I'm not sure how well it displays. Um, in this book, we found examples of cultural mapping projects from Australia, Canada, Estonia, the UK, Egypt, Italy, Malaysia, Malta, Palestine, Portugal, Singapore, Sweden, Syria, uh, the United Arab Emirates, the United States, and Ukraine, which was quite amazing um, in the process of putting this together. And I'd say that since 2015, if anything, the interest and the interest levels around cultural mapping have increased and diversified even further. And I won't go into detail of this, given that I'm the third of three <laughs> you have to listen to. But uh, as part of the introduction to the book, we started to think, we started to notice where some of the influences were coming from in the different writings. There are many others as well that helped to sort of characterize what cultural mapping meant at that time and why it was so difficult to pin down and why it was so internally diverse. And so some of the trajectories which I think of as informing cultural mapping practices involve a whole tra uh, tradition of community empowerment or counter mapping activities, both with indigenous communities, as well as the uh, creation of alternate maps or p uh, people's maps in, in big cities. Um, there was a, a whole tradition, or at least an emerging tradition of cultural mapping within uh, municipal governance in order to build a knowledge base and to mobilize the community to collaborate about and mobilize community collaboration and to use this information to, for planning or strategies or decision making. There was another trajectory around cultural policy, which is very much about um, creative industry or creative sector intelligence gathering documenting what type of creative firms were where and how they grew over time. But also there was a sub-thread of that that looked more at the local level and, and the cultural meanings of place. Um, the last two threads were about academic inquiry where there was a lot of, um, there are diverse uh, disciplinary areas that had a spatial turn where they all started thinking about their topic in terms of space, but at the same time there's this cultural term where cultural came into a lot of different disciplines and the two to put together ended up being um, the, a lot about mapping. And, and mapping became a very trendy term, it probably still is, I haven't checked now. Um, and the last area really was artistic approaches. Beyond artists being interested in maps, as um, part of their art practice and the mapping processes. There was also a growing uh, involvement of artists and the arts as agents in community collaborations and community consultations, et cetera. Et cetera. And so I'll get back to that at the end. So all of these different, um, not entirely conflicting, but influencing um, fields all seem to have a place in what was gradually um, becoming an evolving field, or emerging field. So it's really broad strokes. There, let's see, there are two ideal types of cultural mapping projects, and this is where the kaleidoscope begins. So I'm going to have a few threads to try to organize all the idea, all the different examples. But you will see that uh, although this idea that there is, on one hand, a more instrumental, utilitarian approach to develop this cultural industry intelligent intelligence and at the other end this integrated humanistic approach they're quite they're becoming I think increasingly blended so there's no sort of absolute um, type anymore and some examples so at one end of the spectrum this idea of cultural in industry intelligence is really the focus is to develop an accounting of First of all, the tangible cultural assets, resources, cultural venues, organizations that exist in your city, except neighborhood, whatever. Um, 
and then which you provide information from which you can identify relationships, clusters, gaps, and plan or act from that base. However, the process of putting this together ends up being a, a, not as straightforward usually as that may sa uh, sound, and it reveals um, in a wonderful way, very oftentimes, and I think usually, uh, unexpected resources, unexpected individuals and organizations that exist in the building next door, um, new knowledge, um, alternate perspectives, new cross-sectoral connections, and it can be an advocacy tool to bring together a, a number of different types of agents within or with an interest in culture, and the map serves as a discussion platform or an excuse to get together um, to think about and talk about um, culture in your environment, in cultural development. That's enough. Examples begin. Um, so this is um, an example of this type of approach. This is Malta. This is just before the European cultural capital, where they realized they had been given the designation, but they didn't know what cultural venues they really had. So they spent a year going through neighborhood by neighborhood, talking to residents to document every space that's ever used for a cultural or culture-related activity, inside, outside, anything that could be used for a performance during the year. And this is all online. This is an example from New York City. It's a documentation of, this is the printed map, which as you can imagine is, is quite extensive. There's also online versions of various sorts, and it's the public art that exists and the stories and the dates. They've got an, uh, it's created by an organization called Culture Now. It's a voluntary organization. I don't know if they actually have an employee. It's pretty much all folks that think this is important. Um, there's now there's different history, landmarks, heritage, um, public art. One of the things, and then they've developed things from this database, such as I think there's thousands of boat tours that now take place. To what you can see, but one of the things that was quite a surprise to them, because this is a voluntary citizen-driven initiative for no particular political reason other than they want to celebrate and document public art, that when the floods happened during the last storm a few years ago, they discovered that they're the only ones with a full accounting of the public art that exists in Manhattan. And so suddenly the authorities went, oh, we, they would have no idea what they would have lost if not for this map. So now they've been tied into um, uh, these other um, realms. This is an example from Morocco. This is um, a map that was put together by a collective of cultural organizations and individuals about what types of cultural activities and organizations exist in the country. It was developed in the absence of a cultural policy. So the, the cultural sector actually took it upon themselves to create the map in order to go with it to the government to say, look, this is what we have, because the government wasn't playing the proactive role. So this is their, their platform to go forward. And this is all online as well. And this well, it sort of shows. Um, this is an example uh, from the favelas of Belo Horizonte, Brazil. I think there's hundreds involved. Um, conducted by an organization called Flavelo Iestue, which is, from what I can tell, a one-woman operation, plus a whole lot of volunteers, particularly youth in all the, flavela, youth in all the favelas. The, over the num, I'm trying to think how many years now, probably at least 10 or 15, they've been creating cultural mapping projects, which in some cases are books of poetry um, and photos and biographies of artists and a document, um, documentation of who exists there, what cultural art forms are happening, who, what kind of skills are there, which has been connected in the process to media outlets. So they've created their own broadcaster, a radio broadcaster, their own magazine. Their, their, the events that now happen in the favela are known to the, outside, to the rest of the city in ways that never was. So it was very much a standard mapping type of project, although with a very, particip with a very participatory process. But it's become something new and has driven a lot of new activities, new connections, both within the flavelas and is also with the flavela in the main city. So the other end of the poll 
is the humanistic, more integrated approaches, which are usually very locally focused participatory projects that foreground collective meetings, participatory forums, conversational platforms, meeting places, all of that, workshops. I think some, I think the center photos from here or near, really nearby. Um, and these are really about community um, engagement, I guess is the, more than consultation, it's more about engagement, it's more about sharing ideas, facilitating direct involvement of residents and other um, users of a location or liver, residents of a location in the decisions and discussions about their locale and they create and this opportunity for dialogue and exchanging ideas etc is is core examples um, so this is an example it is in English but it's from a Ukraine city it was part of an um, a nonprofit uh, slash research project that involves seven small seven cities across Ukraine and I can't remember which one this is where um, some of the projects were led by municipalities some by nonprofits some by collective of collections of artists and it was to map out the cultural resources and to think about the future of those cities in cultural terms and and the, it was more than just documenting, it was very much about ideas and aspirations and complaints and criticisms as you might be able to read from some of these. Um, what was interesting is that in one of the cities, the youth decided that the standard monuments that were the historic monuments in the city did not speak for them. So when they created their cultural map, they did not include any of the historical or public art monuments that existed in the city. This is another example called Where is Here? Small Cities Deep Mapping and Sustainable Futures, which was a research project, but very much community-engaged research project involving three smaller cities in British Columbia, Canada. And it was, um, and I think they're trying to go into phase two, um, it was very much about identify, you know, the citizens identifying where the special, meaningful places were to them within the cities, and then creating tours lured out with the participants lured by hot chocolate and cookies and things like this as i recall they were very good at social media this this group um and then the the individual whose story was selected would be in this location where they had selected as very important to them and do a short two minute video on an iPhone and, and upload it to a website. So there's a central website of videos of citizens talking personally about where, what's special to them and where and why. And, and all of the information was then to be gathered and to be integrated into planning processes for the cities. So this was cultural resources, but in a more macro kind of perspective. So it could be the um, the bicycle shop that repairs everything and it's essential to your world, to the cafe where everybody gets together, to the cultural landmarks and icons and, and things like that. So what's clear from all of these, these examples is that these maps do not, not in any way intend to impose um, st to, um, ownership or to make places static or to claim territory, but they really aim to make visible and articulate the multi-layered cultural assets, aspects, and place meanings. I'll get into that a bit more. Um, they reflect and privilege pluralistic cultural, local knowledges, perceptions of importance, and ways of understanding. In many places, it's, there's also an aspect of capturing elders' knowledge and transforming and informing younger generations as part of this um, process and highlighting the dynamic lives of places, which echoes some of the things we've heard already. In the process of doing this, of course, you create processes or catalyze processes, good word we've seen earlier, um, for actively connecting to your place and to deepen their knowledge of your society, of your neighbors, of your place. You develop a platform for collective expression, discussion, and discussion among many groups and action. And it, can and it can guide collective decision making and strategies for future development. Now I'm just going to, how are we doing for time? Oh, okay. <laughs> Three, okay. 
I've got three topics which originally were labeled as trends, and I didn't like that. And I thought, well, it's not really trends. It's more like discussion points, but it's reoccurring themes that keep coming up um, in, the, in the discussions that are clearly not resolved, but might be um, echoed in some of the presentations in the next few days. And of course, the first one of course, is what is culture? What counts as culture? And this phenomenon of an expanding scope and defining culture within local mapping projects. What we're finding is that some of the traditional uh, toolkits, for instance, were designed for big cities with standard cultural infrastructure, such as theaters and galleries and all the official things you expect to see on your map. And it's been diversifying as to where these things are being applied. So you can apply it to smaller places, edge places, small, um, more rural locations, and you'll find out that none of the things you're supposed to be mapping are on your map. And so in some cities, um, when this happened, they, they knew that these locations, these neighborhoods were vibrant hubs of activities and diverse cultural diversity and like why doesn't anything show up on the map and they went and re-examined what they're doing what they're looking at and um, trying to adjust to redefine culture to what makes it meaningful for the residents of a location and to allow them to define this more and so in the way in this way of application to practice the field is emerge is evolving because researchers are taking note of what's happening on the ground first as they're trying to solve these issues. Um, some of the issues that have been um, um, brought forward are oversimplified definitions that don't adequately complex, uh, capture complex activities, events, and spaces, um, uh, big city categories that misrepresent cultural vitality in other places, smaller places, the invisibility of some cultural activities, and that some cultural activities are not conducive to mapping, such as festivals or events that move locations or virtual work. Where do you map that? Even though you know it's happening, it may be significant to your community. Another um, trend is a shift from documenting tangible cultural assets to articulating the plural meanings of places and their stories. And within this, there's a few sub-themes. One is about mapping intangibles, and also this opening to plural meanings of place that are being um, sought now. There was a third that I've taken out for time, which is about personalization and using this mapping to claim your place in that location. Mapping intangibles has been, a, um, I'd say, a fun topic for people to try to wrap their heads around. And I won't go into those definitions. Um, in general, intangible cultural mapping, or cultural intangibles mapping, um, aims to articulate the ways in which meanings and values may be grounded in specific places and embodied experiences, to demonstrate how these cultural intangibles are key to understanding a place and how it is meaningful for its residents and visitors, and to challenge visual dominance to, in order to articulate or reflect multisensorial embodied experience. Now this example here is from Australia, and it's um, an entirely voluntary activity, I think, at this point of someone feeling it was a need. And it's an app that they've developed with an elder from the, the um, First Nations Aboriginal group of that territory that pushes a welcome to you when you enter that territory in Australia. So whether or not it's marked anywhere on the road, you will be welcomed and you're told about the territory and you're told what's significant about it and welcome you to the, to the location. Um, this is an example from a small town in Canada where they, um, it was part of a future envisioning process where they started to collect um, stories and history of, and, and the idea behind these is really about what makes the place special. Yes, the, the core um, physical features may be just the same as all of the other communities around in that geographic area, but why is this one special? What's our special reason for being and what can we um, promote? However, having said that, this is kind of what you end up with in many cases is a Google map with some stories attached to it, which really isn't that interesting. 
to be sorting through, reviewing. They also created a book, which is a little bit more accessible. But in terms of the final product, it's definitely not an immersive sense of, of place. But, you know, it's a being you start. Uh, this is another example um, called Invisible City from Australia. And it was part of a planning process um, to try to um, include the youth voice, the youth perspective of their place. It again used an app and it was very much about engaging with place and young people's experience of the city and the mood and their comments on particular places. It involved walks and um, guided tours and, and things like this with the app and they were encouraged to text away as they went to different locations and all those texts went into a database and there's also a whole um, array of moods and how different places make you feel and it was most of those are happy ones I think they all <laughs> but it was, a, it was um, an innovative sort of reasonably crowdsourced but um, part of getting a, a sense of an imagined future and a, a present day realities Um, the other aspect is about plural meanings of place, and I'm not going to go into this because everyone knows that every place is different to everybody that, that lives there, and particularly with different cultures and different traditions and different times of being there and different experiences. This is an example of um, a, an eco-cultural map, I guess. It's combining historical features and, and stories and places as well as ecological features. It was part of a project called the Islands in the Salish Sea involving... I think 17 islands off the coast of British Columbia, which was an artist-driven but also activist type of project to for the locals to claim what was important of each of the islands before development hit any further. The idea that they're all being threatened by resource development as well as people moving in from the city, and that they wanted that the residents had this meaning or had um, within the residents they had the, the um, knowledge of the place, of what made it special and what they were really keen to retain that nobody else had, that the governments didn't have, and it was actually their responsibility to go forward. Um, having, But as part of that process, it was very much artist-led in each, each um, island with multiple um, maps done as everybody claimed uh, and, and um, set out their specialness of their places and what was important to them of their island in all ages. And another sort of approach of this different pluralistic perspectives um, is seen in work coming from Australia, for example, by Paul Carter, some might have read, who um, is working a lot with bicultural cultural mapping and working with cities and Aboriginal ontologies of landscape and in trying to put that together with planning to produce new spaces, new developments, new understandings. And he talks about an important, I'll just read it, an important emotional landmark in any cultural mapping project should be the reenactment of strangeness, the encounter with the inexplicable that commands a new self-awareness. And he talks a lot about uh, choreotopography, choreographing spaces and flows, and um, the way things move through spaces rather than the static locations. Which brings us to the other, uh, to the third topic I wanted to talk about briefly, um, which is about the growing presence of artistic approaches to mapping. And um, I'm not ready to talk about this in a great deal with. But there, I've just completed um, working with um, a professor, Will, Will Garrett Patz in Canada, and Elise Longley is a professor in New Zealand on artistic approaches to cultural mapping, activating imaginaries and, and means of knowing. It's an edited collection written by art, artists who are, re, are leading what we see as, in many cases, the community-engaged strategies of cultural mapping and putting... And so it's not just artists with maps in their work, which there's a lot of books on that, but it's combining artistic approaches to cultural mapping that they're inventing based on their own disciplines and their own trainings and their own inclinations um, with the field of 
practice-based artistic research and the practices and the, the methodologies developed there with community-engaged strategies and processes. It came out in part because we saw artists being involved more and more as leaders of community consultation or engagement type projects and initiatives, but often as um, interventions <laughs> or temporarily mobilizing and what and the, the citizens because artists are good at attracting attention again people to participate in things but now there seems to be a, a gradual shift where they're now taking on a greater role and they're leading some of these projects um, and processes and since it's lunchtime I <laughs> go into all of this but there's a number of things that we're starting to point to that come out of uh, benefits from an artistic approach or presence to transform the processes of cultural mapping um, by challenging more instrumental approaches, animating and honoring the local, giving voice and definition to the vernacular, recognizing the, pro the notion of place as inhabited by story and history, slowing down the processes of seeing and listening, Asserting and embodying the aesthetic of a key component, of, the embodying the aesthetic as a key component of community of self-expression and self-representation, championing inclusion and experimentation, exposing often unacknowledged power relations, catalyzing identity formation, and in general making the intangible more visible and audible through multiple modes of artistic representation and performance. In the works that we brought together, there are some that are visually based, some are choreographers, some are theater practitioners, site-specific works bringing up the histories. Um, the emphasis is definitely on process more than product and aims to, or promises to engage this sort of a felt sense of community that is often missing in conventional mapping processes. And Five minutes. <laughs> um, and so I didn't want to put this slide before acknowledging that there's a, there's a wide range of dimensions that come into the process that can help transport it into a, a different sort of thing than what we've seen in the past. And it's not necessarily artists that have to lead this, but they are the artistic approaches. Um, but they all, the artists contribute also, the artist contributions also allow space for the imaginary wherein the spaces between reality and possibility are made porous and interlayered. Imagination carries potentials for unseating convention, perspective, actuality, reproducibility, and common sense. Space for imagination can shift research and community planning from a reflective stance to a more future-forming orientation and practice in which life is characterized in terms of continuous becoming and social change is implicated in explorations into what the world could be, could be. By placing the activation of imaginaries at the center of cultural mapping, we prioritize the opening of space for maps that enable alternative views and modes of thinking. With the new ideas they present, artists create space for dwelling. This is where the political and critical vitality of artistic approaches to cultural mapping comes to the fore in terms of exploring the map as a means to chart space, time, experience, relationships, ecologies, moments, and concepts. Sorry, I can't say that as well as <laughs> it was written. So, um, And a few more pictures. This is an example from Japan from a professor, design professor, urban studies, I think, um, of her own ways of trying to uh, recapture the personal in the, the urban planning um, realm. This is um, maps of her walks by season in her neighborhood and retracing the way that one uses and, and interacts with, the, with her space. Um, this is a, actually an old example now from Vancouver from the J Karen Jameson dance. It was a piece called The River which actually traced the underground rivers that had been I don't know, culverted when the city was developed and brought it back to the public imagination to remind them that this is under there. And I know there's a lot of cities that are daylighting those now. I'm not sure they've done that. But it was something that um, I think it's at least 20, 25 years, but it remains in the public imagination. Of course, I haven't said anything about technology, but that's a whole other thing. 
Um, the idea of introducing augmented reality to these processes is also very interesting. This is a project by John Craig Freeman in the U.S. Of, um, and it's not culture as you would normally see, but what makes the place meaningful. This is an app that he's developed and you can download. And if you go to that location, in this location, this is the border between the U.S. and Mexico. And this is the U.S. side. And it basically took all of the locations where bodies have been found and put them all into the app so that when you show, when you see the empty landscape, skeletons flow up wherever they were. So it, it definitely is a different way of um, recognizing and, and paying homage to, to that aspect of the meaningful of this meaningfulness of this place. This is a whole other different thing. It's from a project called Measuring the Non-Measurable out of Japan. And it's run by a design professor originally from Croatia who's been in Japan for, I think, 30 years or something now. And this, again, someone who's railing against the conventions of planning <laughs> approaches and representation approaches. And they're trying to measure the intensity of cities and the um, feeling that you get when they're in the cities through walking and experiencing and having a collective ex um, documentation and expression of those cities. So these three are Hong Kong, Bangkok, and Singapore uh, as a result of three other experts. Two? Yeah, we're almost there. And this was the last slide, so I can <laughs> get you there. Um, I just wanted to give the final word to one of my co-editors from New Zealand who's a dance professor and, has to, and her mission is to push me beyond my comfort zone and become more creative all the time. So this was, this was quite nice though. Um, we, all, we are always enfolded with the maps that hold us, the maps that include us in or exclude us from their borders, the maps that pull us away from or toward others. In our daily movements, we are in a fluid exchange with cartographies of place. We create worlds and worlds create us. Practices of mapping reflect the exchange where places and inhabitants write each other. The places may be abstract or literal, conceptual or material, political or poetic. The inhabitants might be human or non-human. Each formal potential of map creation implies possibilities for moving ideas into the world, whether through representations of data or platforms for imagining. And I thought that was a nice current um, reflection that takes a long, it takes the journey a long way from the original you are collecting data to analysis. Thank you.